Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to another video. I hope you are doing well these days. In this video, we're gonna be covering a topic that deals with a bunch of points that electronic speed control companies within the RC industry don't want you to know. Now let's not waste any time and dive right into the points that we have here today. Our first point talks about the BEC voltage that we get out of our electronic speed controls. BEC simply stands for the battery eliminator circuit that is found on our ESCs. Most people refer to this as the BEC that is on board the electronic speed control. Essentially what it does is allows us to eliminate using an external battery pack to power our receiver as well as the circuit servos that we may have on board or even some additional accessories that we're using on our radio control vehicles. As the name applies, we eliminate needing that battery pack and thus the speed control has its own circuit that takes the battery voltage that you're running for that specific vehicle and drops it down to the typical voltage that you would need for that receiver and servos on board. Essentially what it is doing is acting as a power supply that you would typically even find in a PC or a server room within your office. Those specific power supplies take the typical 120 volts found in North America and drop it down to 5 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, whatever your components within the PC or servers require. However, the big difference is that if you find a quality built power supply for a computer or a server room, it is very unlikely that the voltage will drop when it goes under load. A perfect example is I use a server room power supply for my radio controlled charger. Whether I'm charging a 6S pack at about a half an amp or I'm charging two 6S packs at the exact same time at 10 amps each, I do not see a drop in voltage on the input side of my charger. It stays at exact same amount. However, it is not the case with our electronic speed controls. Now what I've done to determine this is I've tested a bunch of speed controls at the continuous rated power that they are rated for. When looking at the graph, we can see that we get upwards of 25% drop of our initial voltage value from our speed controls. Now this is quite substantial and can be a little bit scary depending on what we're doing. Now for most radio controlled applications or vehicles, it is not going to make much of a difference. Now for those of you that are building your own radio control vehicles and you are using a speed control, it's very important that you pay attention to the Beck current value that you actually get from that speed control. The big reason why this is important is because most modern day radios require an absolute minimum amount of voltage in order to be maintained to stay on. As soon as you end up dropping down below that minimum voltage, your radio will lose its power, it'll shut off, and you lose all control of that specific vehicle. What's going to have to happen in the meantime is your receiver is going to have to completely reboot after losing its minimum voltage to stay powered. It's gonna reboot, turn back on, get the signal from your transmitter again, and then send that back to all the systems on board. This is going to take a bit of time, and in that time, you could simply crash whatever radio control vehicle that you happen to run at that time. The key takeaway here is as long as we have enough power on board, we can maintain the reliability and functionality of our complete radio system. Now coming back to the point that we raised earlier, where some electronic speed controls allow you to adjust the back voltage, my recommendation is to look at that voltage on your servos and see what your servos allow as an absolute maximum. Then once you know that, take a look at what your receiver allows as a maximum, and then what you wanna do is select the back voltage from your speed control at that exact maximum. Now the reason why I'd suggest doing this is because A, your servos servos are going to more than likely produce the most amount of torque that they can under their specific operating range. And you're also going to be able to operate those servos at its fastest speed. This way you get the wheels on your car to turn as quickly as possible, the flaps on your radio controlled airplane to adjust very quickly. And the big reason here is that if you lose a certain percentage of voltage from a higher Beck voltage, you're not going to drop below that absolute minimum required to run your receiver. This is why I would highly recommend 
recommend operating at at least a 5.5 to 6 volt minimum for most systems. You definitely do want to check and make sure the servos can operate at that voltage because there are some servos that will not like anything higher than 5 volts. Now let's move on to our second point, which talks about the maximum continuous current rating that is on a speed control. This is typically what you will find on the label of the speed control in big numbers. All speed control manufacturers use this because it's a very important number for us to know. Now the big thing here is what does it actually mean to us? If we see a 60 amp rating on a speed control, does that mean it can actually sustain 60 amps continuous? Well, the quick answer to this is, not necessarily. We don't know if the speed control manufacturer has done their test and rated that continuous rating based off of their own operating conditions. In some cases, these numbers require a certain amount of airflow over that speed control to take away some of that waste heat and allow that speed control to operate at the rating that you see on the label. Now, in some cases, speed control manufacturers will tell you this right in the instruction manual that it requires a certain airflow in miles per hour or kilometers per hour. This is a good thing to know. However, you don't see this value being specified for every single speed control. What can we learn from this point that we're talking about? Well, essentially, we can ignore that 60 amps that is on the speed control for now. Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is measure the amount of heat that we are going to find within our speed control. If we measure the amount of heat and we're exceeding the maximum threshold for that speed control, that is essentially what our maximum is. It doesn't matter if we measure our maximum at 50 amps and we're at that maximum temperature threshold. If we're seeing the max temperature threshold at 50 amps, that's our new limit for the speed control. Now there is the flip side of this story where guys are running a continuous current of over that 60 amps, for example. You can possibly run 70 amps if you know what you're doing and you're measuring in the right areas the maximum temperature of that speed control. If you are not that expert that's running your radio control vehicle, all you need to do is make sure that you're staying within the 60 amps specified by the manufacturer or the maximum temperature threshold for your speed control. Whichever limit comes first is the limit that you can stick to. Now the third fact that we have here to talk about today deals with partial throttle of our speed controls. In fact, did you know that operating your speed control at a partial throttle is actually very, very inefficient? The closer you operate your speed control just above that 0% throttle, the less efficient that is going to be. And when we're talking about efficiency, we're talking about the electrical amount of power that you have to put into that system and then how much mechanical power that you're getting out of it. Now we spent quite a bit of time looking at all the different efficiencies that we get right from 100% throttle all the way down to about the 20% mark. And what we have learned is that at 100% throttle, we get the most amount of efficiency out of our speed control and motor system. As soon as you end up approaching that 20% mark, every step along the way, you're going to get a drop of efficiency. With this being said, if you operate a radio controlled airplane or drone, you're trying to get the most amount of flight time out of your specific vehicle, what you want to do is you want to figure out how you can operate at 100% throttle. This doesn't mean that you take your pylon racer and you operate at 100% throttle and you're doing 3,000 miles an hour around in a circle. No, this means that you have to dial your system back so that 100% throttle is now your cruise speed. This is how you're going to get the most amount of efficiency out of that system. Now, if you want more details about the throttle position versus the amount of efficiency you get out of your speed control motor combination, take a look at the link that I'll leave in the description below. Now, our last point, our final one for today, this is going to be our fourth one for the day, is going to be about the PWM switching rate that we have within our speed control. Now, in order to get those partial throttles that we were talking about, you're going to have to chop up the signal that gets sent to the motor, and this is going to be a drive signal or the power signal that gets sent to our motor. If we operate at 100%, we are going to get maximum rotational speed out of our motor. However, if we want to decrease that motor speed, this is where we have to introduce that PWM switching. Now, motor manufacturers probably don't want you to know that as you increase the PWM rate, you're going to get better efficiency out of your speed control and motor as a system. 
Now the reason why speed control manufacturers don't want you to know that is because as you increase the switching rate of the speed control under partial throttle, it is going to be a lot more work for that speed control to perform that switching. It's gonna to have to switch that circuit on and off thousands and thousands of times every second. And this is a lot of work for that speed control to do. The takeaway for this specific point is if you want to get the maximum amount of efficiency that you can and you do want to experiment with the PWM switching rate of your electronic speed control, make certain that you pay attention to the temperature of that specific speed control. You may see an increase in temperature at the exact same wattage values that you have been measuring before. This is because of that additional work that we were talking about that that speed control is now going to have to do for you. Now, very similar to the previous point that we just talked about, if you wanna see more details about PWM switching rate versus our actual efficiencies, take a look at the description below and I'm gonna make sure I leave a link so that you can check out that video. Now that pretty well covers it for our video today. I hope you were able to learn something or have some point to take away from exactly what we talked about today. As always, like the video if you do and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that I can see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one.